Zack Snyder's Justice League comes out this week. And for months now, I've been teasing a video going into the history of the DCEU, talking about how it happened, why it is the way it is, and what it could have been along the way. Unfortunately, that won't happen, because instead of making one video, I've elected to make a three-part series instead, with this part covering a version of the DCEU that we've never seen, but one that we came very close to seeing. That being what I refer to as the Mortalverse, a universe that would have begun with the unmade George Miller film, Justice League Mortal. It was a pretty promising start to the DCEU, but what went wrong? Why did it take an extra 8 years for a Justice League movie to hit screens? And how come this promising plan eventually became the lackluster DC Extended Universe that we have today? Well, we'll get into that, but right now let's just talk about how the DC Extended Universe came to be. The first hint of a DC Cinematic Universe was happening in the late 90s, but it wasn't really a cinematic universe as we know it, of a long-form narrative being planned out across multiple films in multiple franchises. In the late 90s, Tim Burton was assigned to direct a Superman reboot called Superman Lives, and there were actually plans for this movie to take place in the same universe as the 90s Batman movies. In Kevin Smith's draft of the screen, play, Batman would show up as Superman's funeral. However, later interviews with Michael Keaton show that plans for Batman's inclusion in the movie changed with later drafts. When asked if he was going to reprise his role of Batman in the movie, Keaton replied with, not exactly, leading people to believe that maybe Bruce Wayne would have a role in the movie, but would it be Batman? This is unconfirmed. And obviously, Superman Lives never ended up happening. Fast forwarding to 2002, at this point, Warner Brothers was developing a handful of DC movies. The three they were working on the most actively were Superman The Man of Steel, also known by fans as Superman Flyby, a Superman reboot written by J.J. Abrams, Batman Year One, a Batman reboot written by Darren Aronofsky and Frank Miller and directed by Aronofsky, which would have reinvented the character, and Batman vs. Superman, written by Akiva Goldsman. These movies were all being made by different people and had different goals and angles on their characters, so they weren't made with the intention of being in the same universe. But it's hard to believe that with a Superman reboot intended to start a franchise, a Batman reboot, and a Batman and Superman team up all in development with WB at the same time, it is kind of hard to believe that WB wasn't seeing Batman vs Superman as a potential team up between the two franchises. With that being said, if you look into what each movie was, their continuities wouldn't have matched up. With a rewrite, you could probably fit Flyby into the team up, but Batman Year One was a Batman origin that reinvented the character, and Batman vs Superman had a more Dark Knight Returns Batman right from the comics. None of these movies ever got made though. Batman Year One was too out there for WB, so they ended up doing other Batman projects instead. Batman vs Superman was sidelined for Superman Flyby, and Superman Flyby evolved into Superman Returns once Bryan Singer signed on as director. But the first time a true cinematic universe was brought up was in 2007. With Marvel beginning production on the first two movies of their plan cinematic universe, DZ decided they would start their own. Not only that, but they would beat Marvel to the punch on a big crossover movie. In February 2007, writing duo Kieran and Michelle Mulroney were hired by Warner Brothers to write a Justice League movie, which would take the name Justice League Mortal. The plan was for production to start in early 2008 and have it released in mid-2009, beating Marvel's Avengers movie by a few years. The movie would have featured the Justice League already formed, with Maxwell Lord as the villain. There were plans at one point for Brandon Routh to play Superman and Christian Bale to play Batman, looping Batman Begins, Superman Returns, and The Dark Knight into the Mortalverse, though these quickly disappeared. Superman Returns didn't do well enough to warrant a sequel, so it was a better idea to recast and start a new franchise after Justice League Mortal. As you may expect, no one associated with the Dark Knight movies wanted it to be in the Mortalverse, so they recast. Thus, Justice League Mortal was now the first movie in the Mortalverse. Some people claim it would be an unwise decision to start a DC Cinematic Universe with a Justice League movie instead of slowly building up each character in solo movies before teaming them up, but I disagree. Starting with Justice League can work, especially with DC. When Marvel built their universe, no one knew about most of their characters, so it was important to introduce each of them to the world. 
However, people know the DC characters, and even the ones that are even remotely obscure are pretty easy to understand on a surface level. Everyone knows Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, etc. And it's not like they had to show the origins of each character and how the League formed in the movie. The MCU used the approach of starting in a world where superheroes don't exist. Iron Man was the first superhero or at least he was the first recent public superhero. So having a lived-in universe for DC could have been refreshing. To show you how invested DC was in this universe, at the time that the Mulroneys were hired to write Justice League Mortal, David S. Goyer had been writing a Flash solo movie for some time that wouldn't exactly fit in the Mortalverse. You'd expect one of the scripts to be rewritten, especially considering David S. Goyer co-wrote Batman Begins. But no, David S. Goyer left over creative differences and new writers were assigned to write a Flash movie that would work in the Mortalverse. George Miller signed on to direct and much of pre-production was done. Most of the principal cast was locked in. Army Hammer was cast as Batman, Megan Gale as Wonder Woman, DJ Katrona as Superman, Adam Brody as The Flash, Hugh Keys Byrne as Martian Manhunter, Teresa Palmer as Talia Al Ghul, Zoe Kazan as Iris Allen, Santiago Cabrera as Aquaman, Jay Barucho as Maxwell Lord, Common as the Jon Stewart Green Lantern, and Anton Yelkin as Wally West. Everything fell apart as filming kept getting pushed back for a few reasons. Originally filming would have taken place in Australia, but because of tax reasons, WB wanted to film in Canada instead. But Miller kept fighting to film in Australia. WB also wanted the script to be revised, but it couldn't due to the writer's strike happening at the time. So eventually WB elected to push back a Justice League movie and do solo movies first instead. At one point, the 2011 Green Lantern movie would have been the first movie in the DCEU. But after it flopped, it wasn't worth making sequels, so therefore it wasn't worth being the start of their universe. But there was new hope on the horizon. In 2013, after the Dark Knight trilogy was done, a Superman reboot was coming. It's important to keep in mind how much of a slam dunk Man of Steel seemed to WB. Whether or not you liked the movie, the deck was definitely stacked in its favor. It was released the year after the Dark Knight trilogy ended, meaning they wouldn't have to deal with having two continuities. Also, it was a Superman reboot. and. I don't think there's a single project more ideal for launching a DC Cinematic Universe than a Superman reboot. On top of that, pretty much everyone that WB associated with making good DC movies was behind it. David S. Goyer was the writer of the movie, having previously co-written Batman Begins and co-writing the stories for The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises. He also wrote a script for an unproduced Flash movie and produced a script called Green Arrow Escape from Supermax, though that likely was supposed to take place in the Mortalverse and it too was never realized. Christopher Nolan, the director and co-writer for all three Dark Knight movies, was an executive producer and wrote the story with Goyer, and Zack Snyder, who had previously directed Watchmen, was signed on as director. Watchmen hadn't been a ginormous success, but it was praised by its direction. Not to mention that the initial idea that Goyer had pitched to WB was to do to Superman what they had previously done to Batman with the Dark Knight movies, put the character in the real world and look at the story from a realistic point of view. And obviously the Dark Knight movies had done well, so why wouldn't this work too? In 2012, after shooting had wrapped on Man of Steel, Will Beal was hired to write the script for a Justice League movie. At this point, the studio was working on some solo movies they were hoping would come out in the next few years, including a Flash movie from the writers of Green Lantern and a Wonder Woman movie helmed by Patty Jenkins. Eventually, the Flash movie as it was was cancelled and Patty Jenkins would leave Wonder Woman only to come back to it later. Will Beale's script was not well received by Warner Brothers. The script involved the Justice League forming and fighting Darkseid arriving on Earth. A key part of the script involved Superman seeing a future where Darkseid has conquered Earth and the Flash using time travel to stop that from happening. If you're familiar at all with Zack Snyder's plans for Justice League, this will sound very familiar. Superman would also become evil and there would have been a Batman vs Superman fight. 
The main problem was that this script tried to fit in too much. The script was essentially the cliff notes of Goyer and Snyder's later plans for the franchise. Since WB liked David S. Goyer's take on Superman, they hired him to rewrite the Justice League script. The details around this period are a bit fuzzy, but basically by the end it was decided that the Will Beale script served better as a sequel to a first Justice League movie, with some of its elements being incorporated into a first Justice League movie showing its team assembling and fighting Steppenwolf as a precursor to Darkseid coming in the sequel. The idea also came about to use a Man of Steel sequel as an opportunity to do a precursor to Justice League, introducing Batman and other characters in the world, and fitting in the Batman vs Superman fight from Beale's script, while also planting seeds for the Justice League. And just like that, the very first plan for the DCEU was made by Goyer. They'd do a Batman v Superman movie planting the seeds of Justice League, a Justice League movie of the team forming and fighting Steppenwolf, and a Justice League sequel where the team fights Darkseid and saves the world with time travel. They also changed the lineup for the League a bit. Beale's lineup included Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Green Arrow, Aquaman, the Jon Stewart Green Lantern, and Hawkman. But Goyer's team started as Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and Cyborg, mimicking the new 52 lineup, with the plan being that they would introduce a Green Lantern to the team, but in a sequel to Justice League rather than having him be a founding member. Zack Snyder signed on to direct the Man of Steel follow-up and Justice League, which led to him being a primary creative force behind the movie alongside Goyer. At this point, Warner Brothers had started development on other movies for the DCEU as well, and in 2014, they announced their slate for the DCEU. In 2016, Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, written by Goyer and directed by Snyder, and Suicide Squad, written and directed by David Ayer, would come to theaters. In 2017, Wonder Woman, which had not yet found a director, would be coming out alongside Justice League Part 1, directed by Zack Snyder. Announced for 2018 were The Flash and Aquaman, for 2019, Shazam and Justice League Part 2, and for 2020, Cyborg and Green Lantern. It was also announced that The Batman, starring Ben Affleck, and a more direct sequel to Man of Steel were also in development for release at some point, presumably wherever room would open up on the slate in the coming years. So with this in place, work by Goyer and Snyder would begin with Batman v Superman's script and further development happening with the Justice League movies. It was somewhere along this point that it was decided that there would actually be three Justice League movies, not two, with Justice League 2 ending on a cliffhanger of Darkseid taking over Earth, and Justice League 3 showing the time travel fixing everything. I'm kind of glad I pushed off this history of DCEU because just a week or so, storyboards have come public that show the plans for Justice League 2 or 3, or as the storyboards refer to them, Justice League 2 and 2A. So now I can tell a more accurate tale, though keep in mind these storyboards were made in 2015 and do not show the final plans. There were multiple differences. For example, a large part of the Justice League trilogy would have revolved around a love triangle between Clark, Lois, and Bruce, but this was taken out before the first Justice League movie was filmed, unless they decide to surprise us with it in the Snyder Cut, so that's not happening in the sequels. Also, the cast in the Nightmare World is different between storyboards and reality. The storyboards include Deadshot, who would be taken out, and do not include either Deathstroke or Joker. In fact, none of the Justice League movies were originally supposed to have these characters. Deathstroke would be added before filming, possibly as a replacement for Deadshot once Deathstroke became the villain of the Batman, and Joker was actually added to the Snyder Cut due to additional filming in late 2020. Also, Green Lantern doesn't show up until the third movie in this one, but it's been documented that the final plans included Green Lantern joining in Justice League 2, and there being cameos of some kind in Justice League 1. There were also a few villains that were planned to appear in the DC movies that have since evolved past the versions seen in the storyboards, coming back to the Justice League movies. So, you can read the storyboards to get the full picture, but essentially, Justice League 2 would feature Lex assembling a Legion of Doom to crack the anti-life equation and bring Darkseid to Earth, with the Legion including Dr. Maru from Wonder Woman, Ocean Master and Black Manta from Aquaman, the Riddler, who was planned to appear in The Batman at this point, and Captain Cold, who was planned to be a villain in The Flash at the time. Lex would be successful, but then Darkseid would turn on him. He would kill Lois before Superman could arrive to save her, weakening his will to the point that Darkseid could use the anti-life equation to turn Superman evil and take over the world. 
Justice League 3 would start in the nightmare we saw in BVS, with a group of survivors including Batman, Green Lantern, Cyborg, Mira, and the aforementioned others dying to send the Flash back in time to the events of the previous movie, with Barry convincing Bruce to talk to Lois, who has been unraveling Lex's plan, and strategize. In this version, Bruce sacrifices himself to save Lois so that Superman can get them in time to cause Darkseid to retreat and save the League. The movie would end with humans, Atlanteans, and Amazonians all joining together with the Justice League to stop Darkseid's invasion. There would also be a flash forward of Lois and Clark's son, who at this point was biologically Lois and Bruce's, growing up to be the next Batman. But all of this went south. A lot of people see Justice League as the point where these plans went out the window, but I see Batman v Superman as the real turning point. How? Well, let's talk about it. Contrary to popular belief, Justice League wasn't really what killed the DCEU, at least not from my perspective. That was Batman v Superman. While not nearly to the extent of Justice League, there were some behind the scenes difficulties with BVS, mainly regarding the script. So far, I refer to David S. Goyer as the one tasked with writing BVS, but if you watch the movie, you'll notice that there are two writers, David S. Goyer and Chris Terrio. So what happened? Well, I'll give you a hint. David S. Goyer didn't write his script with Chris Terrio. Apparently, while David S. Goyer was originally the sole writer of the movie, Warner Brothers wasn't satisfied with his script for one reason or another. Goyer ended up leaving the film due to creative differences, and WB hired Chris Terrio to rewrite his script to their specification. This was kind of a big deal, considering that at this point, Goyer and Snyder were the main architects of the DCEU. So now it was just Zack Snyder, though Terrio would end up taking Goyer's place in a sense. Something interesting to note is that even though we know that David S. Goyer did some writing on Justice League, even the Snyder Cut doesn't credit him as a writer. This wouldn't be such a big deal if Will Beale didn't get a story credit. So, either few or none of Goyer's ideas were actually used in the script for Justice League, or the breakup between him and WB was ugly enough that either his name was removed from the movie by WB, or he asked for his name to be removed from the movie. Anyway, Batman v Superman didn't just have an interesting behind the scenes issue, it also gave near irreversible damage to the DCEU. Basically, BBS was made on a budget of $250 million, and if you double that because movie budgets don't include marketing budget, and generally they spend just as much marketing the movie as they do making it, it cost WB $500 million. Its box office gross was a little more than $800 million, so it actually brought in $300 million of profit. That's not a small amount of money. But this was the first time Batman and Superman were ever together on theater screens, and Wonder Woman and Lex Luthor were there too. So WB expected this movie to bring in $1 billion easy. It should have made WB at least $500 million profit. So it didn't meet expectations. At the same time BVS came out, so did Deadpool. Deadpool was made on a budget of $75 million, and to be fair, that definitely had more than $75 million in marketing, so let's say with marketing it cost $200 to $250 million. Deadpool grossed $700 million, so it profited $450 to $500 million, or around what WB wanted BVS to make. This was a point of reflection for WB. It had made BBS in a more artistic, unconventional way than Marvel generally did things, under the pretenses that if they were different from Marvel, that would help them stand out and make money. But that clearly didn't work, so they needed course correction. They decided that there were essentially two types of superhero movies, Avengers movies and Deadpool movies. Any movie that could be a family-friendly movie would be a family movie with a balance of action and humor, like most of the MCU movies. Any movie that didn't have the potential to be an Avengers movie had to be violent and quippy, like Deadpool. Let's talk about what was going on in the DCEU at this point. Suicide Squad had just finished its principal photography at the end of 2015, though reshoots hadn't started. 
Wonder Woman was currently filming, wrapping up its main stretch of filming in London before it would spend a small amount of time filming in Paris, and then some time filming in Italy before taking a break and coming back to reshoot. Justice League was in pre-production, and the plan was essentially a few months after BVS came out they would film Justice League 1 and 2 back to back for release in 2017 and 2019 respectively. With the announcement of a two-part movie and the back-to-back -back filming, it would make it much more of a surprise for Justice League Part 2 to end on a cliffhanger. After the film was released in mid-2019, they would announce Justice League Part 3, which would begin production ASAP. Maybe it would have come out in mid-2021, though it's possible that since David S. Scorer had been heavily involved in the planned Green Lantern Corps movie, that movie would be put on hold and Justice League Part 3 could take its spot on the release schedule. However, the reactions to BVS changed everything. While Wonder Woman was already a very Marvel-like movie in many ways, Suicide Squad was supposed to be a dark, soulful movie, and Justice League, which again was about to start filming, was supposed to be a similar, if less dark, BVS. So, there was course correction to be done. This is why the Warner Brothers subsidiary DC Films was created, to focus efforts on correcting the DCEU. Chief Creative Officer of DC Entertainment, Jeff Johns, was named President of DC Films, and Producer John Berg was named Vice President, though they would both step down not long after Justice League came out. So essentially, Jeff Johns' job was to rewrite the scripts for Suicide Squad and Justice League to better conform with what Warner Brothers executive Kevin Sujihara, specifically, but also others, wanted for the franchise, along with helping to write and develop future DC movies to work with these guidelines. In the case of Suicide Squad, that meant rewriting it to be more like Deadpool in time for reshoots, which allegedly resulted in an inferior cut to what writer and director David Ayer originally wanted. Though the Ayer cut has not been released, so until it does we have no way of really being sure. As for Justice League, that was a little more complicated. Chris Terrio's Justice League script had already been written and filming was about to begin, with no time for Jeff Johns to rewrite the script prior to filming. The decision was made to put filming for Justice League 2 on hold and just film Justice League 1, which was now renamed from Justice League Part 1 to just Justice League. Because there was no time to rewrite prior to filming, the set environment for Justice League initially was essentially Zack Snyder would be shooting the original script, with Jeff Johns being in the back rewriting the script to WB specifications, handing pages to Zack Snyder to film, with DC essentially filming two movies at once. At this point, the script for Ben Affleck's Batman movie was getting along, and it was thought that right after filming was done on Justice League, they would use the resources they would have used on Justice League 2 to film the Batman, especially given that it acted almost as a Justice League 1.5, with a post credit scene even being filmed for Justice League to set up Deathstroke, a minor villain of Justice League, to be the main villain of the Batman. However, filming kept getting pushed back due to script problems as well as personal problems with Ben Affleck. Deathstroke would end up being cut out of Justice League anyway, so the film was put on hold and eventually evolved into what it is now, a standalone movie not in the DCEU. But back to Justice League. By the time principal photography had taken place, Warner Brothers still thought the movie wasn't mainstream enough. They apparently had a writer's summit with a bunch of comic book movie writers who watched what they had so far and gave their thoughts. One of these was Joss Whedon, and Warner Brothers ended up hiring him to further rewrite the script with Jeff Johns for reshoots. Between principal photography and reshoots, Zack Snyder worked on post-production on the movie and put together an assembly cut of the movie based on the original script, but then, unfortunately, Autumn, one of Zack Snyder's daughters, tragically committed suicide. So Snyder had to leave Justice League to mourn this loss. But of course, Warner Brothers still needed to finish this movie, so Joss Whedon was hired to direct the reshoots. It was at this point that things got out of hand. Zack Snyder had been fighting back against Warner Brothers' decisions at the time, constantly compromising with them so that everyone would be happy, and has gone on the record saying that Jeff Johns' initial rewrites during principal photography were understandable and didn't really cripple the film. But once Zack was gone, Warner just went hog wild on this movie. Production on the reshoots was a level of hell I can't begin to describe. 
Ray Fisher has since come out and said that Joss Whedon was very abusive on the set of Justice League. While you could argue he was under intense pressure from WB, that's not really an excuse, and since then, the situation has been investigated, and Warner Brothers found him guilty, firing him from a recent project with them. Ray Fisher also stated that Jeff Johns and John Berg also enabled and maybe even participated in this abusive and sometimes racist behavior, though Warner Brothers has repeatedly said that in their investigation they found no evidence of this. Ray Fisher has of course said they're lying, but right now we really don't know for sure who's telling the truth. As much as I'm not here to defend Joss Whedon as a person, those who say that he ruined Justice League aren't really right. Justice League isn't a Joss Whedon movie, it's a Warner Brothers movie. It has some Snyder, some Johns, some Whedon, some Sujihara, and some of every WB exec at the time Frankenstein into the movie. So in a way, there's no real way for Zack Snyder's Justice League to possibly be worse than the theatrical cut, if for no other reason than that it has a vision to it. Though I will say that for those of you Snyder nuts out there, don't watch the Snyder Cut expecting it to be what you would have seen in theaters if he had remained in control. First of all, it's four hours long. If this had been released theatrically, it would have been about three hours. Also, there was additional filming for the Snyder Cut, including some stuff that Snyder actually came up with in the intervening years since he left the project. And finally, this is based on the Terrio script, and the best we could have gotten theatrically would have been the Terrio John script. But, at the same time, it really will be his nearly uncompromised vision of the movie. So enjoy it. Even if you didn't like Watchmen, Man of Steel, or BVS, go into this wanting to like it, man, you might. Really, the lesson is just to be nice to other people's viewpoints, whether you like it or not. Uh, that goes for Snyder superfans, too. And if you don't have HBO Max and want to avoid spoilers, then you should probably move. After all. We live in a society where spoilers run rampant. I hope you liked this little series, and if you did, subscribe because there might be something coming to your subscription box very soon that I think you'll really like. And I don't just mean the same day Snatter Cut review, so don't forget to subscribe for daily videos on the franchises you love, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.